Uh, so nice to see all of you here. It's, it's just um, to see this place, this beautiful room fill up is, is such a pleasure. Oh, there's Karen, my friends, coming in. <laughs> She's finding her way in. It's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to um, our celebration of, of, of the life in poetry of Galway Canal. To gather together here with all of you in this beautiful and historic room to hear Galway's poems today read by this esteemed group of poets who have come from near and far to do so is, is truly a joy. The people of Vermont have had the chance to hear poetry in many public places, from the pine forest of the Bread and Puppet Farm to the art gallery at the Athenaeum, and at the newly formed Backroads readings up in the little white church in Brownington, and here in the Vermont State House when 12 years ago, we honored another Vermont poet in this room, Hayden Carruth. Thanks to Galway, there are hundreds of Vermonters who have had the opportunity to have their lives changed by hearing poetry. He's been so generous to uh, read his poems in every little nook and cranny of this state for many, many years. I actually have to say, I got a call this morning from a gentleman who had a seventh grade class in St. Johnsbury, and Galway came to read in his class in 1967. <laughs> so you can see that he's been, he's been reading, creating readings, inspiring readings for Vermonters for a long time, and we're incredibly fortunate to have had him in our midst for, for so long. So today we're gonna to hear many poems from his lifetime of writing. Um, each poet will read poems in the order that they are listed in your program. And I would encourage you to sit back, relax, open your heart, and just enjoy and savor savor the poetry. Um, it's, um, it's a remarkable body of work and we're, we're going to enjoy many, many, many poems from all of his, all of his decades of writing. Um, I do want to thank quickly our private and um, corporate uh, supporters. They include the Vermont Arts Council, the Vermont Humanities Council, the Vermont Community F Foundation, the Vermont, Vermont Public Radio, Vermont Public Television, the Ann Livingston Fund, and the Vermont Department of Libraries. Yes. <laughs> Plus our many, many, many private uh, supporters. I'm going to say one word, cell phones. And you all know what to do with your cell phones at this moment, if you wouldn't mind. Um, and now, as a special guest, I'd like to introduce former Governor Madeline Kunin to say a few words. seen so many poets and lovers of poetry in this space. I don't know what you're called, a gaggle of poets? <laughs> Flock of poets? I won't go further. I can only imagine, though, what if you were not only sitting in legislative seats here this afternoon, but what if? <laughs> what if you were the legislators? <laughs> Thank you. 
I mean, think of what Walt Mitt Whitman would have had to say, and think of what Galway Canal would say. If poets could make laws, the world would be different. You know, I had the honor when I was governor of appointing Galway Canal the poet laureate. Uh, Robert Frost was appointed in 1961, and he remained the poet laureate long after his death in 1963. <laughs> and by the time I was elected, somebody thought up the idea, why don't I have a living poet? <laughs> so I thought that was a great idea. So one poetry society came to me, and they had debated long and hard, and selected their poet recommended to me. Um, and I thought, this is fun. I like poetry. I like poets. This is going to be easy. But then something else happened. Turned out there was another Vermont Poetry Society in southern Vermont. Um, so we had what to do. You know, they had their favorite poet. Northern Vermont had its favorite poet. Uh, and they were both adamant about the brilliance of their own poet. So I didn't know what to do. So we had something you might call a poetry reading bake-off. Um, in southern Vermont, and they each read their poems, and sure enough, hands down, we didn't have to take a vote, Galway Canal was the winner. And I think he really transformed the role of Poet Laureate. He made it, he was not only a living poet, thank God, but <laughs> He was an active poet, as was just noted. He went to schools, he went to poetry readings, he went to libraries, and he's been a treasure for the state of Vermont. Not only here, of course, but worldwide. So that's one decision I absolutely know I did the right thing. <laughs> so, and the South kind of receded. Or, <laughs> So we're in for a treat this afternoon, and I'm very thrilled to be able to listen to his poetry read by poets. And I think in addition to maple syrup, we're probably the greatest producer of poetry in the United States. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Madeline. Wow, that's exciting, isn't it? Um, uh, now I would like to welcome um, editor, writer, uh, VPR commentator, um, explorer, outdoorsman, bird watcher, and someone I think has sort of interpreted this beloved state of Vermont for a lot of us for a long period of time. Please welcome Tom Slayton. Thank you very much. Uh, I have to, before I uh, give you my prepared remarks, I, I want to recall two lines by another poet, Madeline Cunin. And Madeline, uh, during the Poetry Bake Off uh, and the controversy surrounding it, wrote uh, a poem that I still quote to people. The other poet was uh, one William Mundell, a very good local poet. And Madeline wrote, Galway Cannell and William Mundell. Who would have thought they would rhyme so well? <laughs> you can't say anything. We're going to remember it. <laughs> uh, but let me, let me uh, say to this gathering of the tribes that Galway Cannell has devoted his life to poetry and is one of America's best and most famous poets. He is the winner of the Pulitzer Prize for Poetry and the National Book Award, among many other honors and awards, and is the author of more than 20 books of poetry. His renown is literally international. His poems are treasured by many thousands of readers for their clarity, intensity, and beauty. 
From 1989 to 1993, he was Poet Laureate of Vermont. He has spent most of his life here in Vermont, and we are all the richer for that fact. He loves the silence of his hillside home in Sheffield, and he likes the creatures he shares that hillside with. Galway is unhappy about moose hunting because it has made the moose that live near his home more wary, and they don't come calling as they once did. He recalls how once, when a car was parked up next to his house in a place that had previously been vacant, a moose stopped, looked at it, came closer, and seemed quite attracted by it. Almost, Galway said, as if he thought it might be a suitable mate. <laughs> there are posters on the walls of his Vermont studio with poems by various poets, including his own wonderful blackberry eating, which somehow manages to bring together in a single poem the mystery of the sweet dark fruit and the mystery of language. Blackberry eating gives a good sense of what Cannell often does in poetry, matching his intellectual interests with his own personal experience and infusing both with an indefinable feeling of profound importance, a sense of something not quite seen yet of great moment just below the shimmering surface of the clear, brilliant language. His poems often focus on the sacramental qualities of everyday life, birth, death, love, sex, the beauty of nature, and they are often witty and humorous as well. His poetry seems broad and comprehensive enough to touch all of human experience, which is why Cannell, though deeply influenced by his life in Vermont, is much more than simply a Vermont poet. His fascination with poetry began early in life, by the time he was a student at Princeton, he knew that writing poetry was the only thing he wanted to do. It was Walt Whitman's writing that first gave Cannell a sense of what poetry could express and accomplish. It seemed, he said after reading Whitman, that it might be possible to say everything in poetry. Cannell's voice in his own free verse is less sweepingly rhetorical than Whitman's. It can be just as intense, but is more natural in its rhythms and more closely focused on his life, his loves, and the natural world he observes. The subjects of his poems have followed the course of his life closely, his experiences as a father, lover, teacher, his fascination with animals and the natural world, his love of literature and art are all expressed in his poetry. Some of his best known poems are imaginative explorations of his life and the lives of the grand animal like animals like moose that share his home. But they are not pleasant or pastoral. The bear, for example, describes a blood and excrement soaked hunt that ends with a poet literally inside the bear's hacked carcass. Finally, soaked with blood and awful, he imagines spring coming as the she-bear quote, lies licking lumps of smeared fur and drizzly eyes into shapes. And the poet, the hunter who has become the animal he hunts, asks himself, quote, what anyway was that sticky infusion, that rank flavor of blood, that poetry by which I lived? It has been said that the function of poetry is to wake us up and enable us to live fuller lives, to see more deeply and clearly, and to love the world more completely. By that standard, Cannell has devoted his life to waking the rest of us up to this life we inhabit, a fact which may account for his passionate devotion to his craft. It's part of a poet's duty to oppose evil, he says, and he remains deeply concerned about human aggression and destructiveness. The ultimate poem, he said to me once, would probably be the poem that would solve for us the mystery of why human beings can't live in peace with themselves. His book-length poem, The Book of Nightmares, uses his experiences in the civil rights struggle and his opposition to the Vietnam War as the basis for some of his most powerful poetry. It also contains some of the most tender, heartfelt, and beautifully expressed poems ever written on the subject of fatherhood and children and ends with the strike, one, of which, one poem of which ends with the striking statement, the wages of dying is love. That is a key concept for Cannell, that we must, by virtue of coming into this world, suffer, die, and leave it. But to somehow balance that stark fact, we receive the recompense of love and more. 
More and more in his later poems, he uses wit and humor to attract our attention, entertain us, and then dazzle us with a brilliant insight. In Oatmeal, he takes a wry, understated tongue-in-cheek tone as he explains how he prepares oatmeal in the morning. He then adds, quote, I am aware that it is not good to eat oatmeal alone. Its consistency is such that it is better for your mental health if somebody eats it with you. <laughs> and so, Canal continues, he thinks up an imaginary companion to eat with. He imagines breakfasting with John Keats and recounts hilariously Keats telling him how he wrote Ode to a Nightingale and, that, and why that poem moves forward as Canal says, quote, with God's reckless wobble. Without warning, in the midst of the comic poem, Canal gives us a stunning bit of insight. He says, and it occurs to me, maybe there is no sublime, only the shining of the Amnion's tatters. The Amnion is the glistening sack that mammals are born in. And so Canal's morning oatmeal glistening in the bowl somehow evokes the sublime a key concept of romantic literature and suggests that the human longing for the sublime, that is for drama, meaning, and transcendence in life, may be part of the sense of tattered incompleteness that haunts us from birth. John Keats himself would have been impressed, perhaps even pleased. And we in Vermont should surely be also pleased, impressed, and much, much more. Thank you, Galway for your lifelong devotion to the mystery of language, the wonder of poetry, and for deepening our lives. Well, what would we vote on? Um, something about Galway, I suppose, and how his poetry has changed our lives. And I think also um, how poetry has brought us together here uh, because of you. And that's a deep achievement. First song. Then it was dusk in Illinois. The small boy, after an afternoon of carding dung, hung on the rail fence. A sapped thing, wary to crying. Dark was growing tall. And he began to hear the pond frogs all calling on his ear with what seemed their joy. Soon their sound was pleasant for a boy listening in the smoky dusk and the nightfall of Illinois. And from the fields, two small boys came bearing cornstalk violins, and they rubbed the cornstalk bows with resins, and the three sat there scraping of their joy. It was now fine music the frogs and the boys did in the towering Illinois twilight make. And into dark, in spite of a shoulder ache, a boy's hunched body loved out of a stalk the first song of his happiness. And the song woke his heart to the darkness and into the sadness of joy. And the second poem I'm going to read, <clears throat> so first song is, is an early poem that comes from uh, What a Kingdom It Was. And the second poem I'll read is called The Stone Table, which is from um, Strong As Your Hold, uh, Galway's uh, last book. The Stone Table. Here on the hill, behind the house, we sit with our feet up on the edge of the eight by 10 stone slab. 
that was once the floor of the cow pass that the cows used getting from one pasture to the other without setting a hoof on the dirt road lying between them. From here, we can see the blackberry thicket, the maple sapling the moose slashed with his cutting teeth, turning it scarlet too early, the bluebird boxes from now, flown from now, the one tree left of the ancient orchard popped out all over with saffron, and rosy subacid pieapples, smaller crabs grafted with scions of old varieties, freedom, sops of wine, Wolf River, and trees we put in ourselves, dotted with red lumps. We speak in whispers. Fifty feet away, under a red spruce, a yearling bell lolls on its belly, eating clover. Abruptly, it sits up. Did I touch my wine glass to the table, setting it humming? The bear peers about with the bleary undressedness of old people who have mislaid their eyeglasses. <laughs> it ups its muzzle and sniffs. It fixes us, whirls and plunges into the woods, a few cracklings and shatterings, and all is still. As often happens, we find ourselves thinking similar thoughts, this time of a friend who lives to the south of that row of peaks, burnt yellow in the sunset. About now, he will be paying his daily visit to her grave, reading.